Welcome, my brothers, to this third module or unit number three in this course of pastoral theology. I'm personally grateful that you've taken the time, spent the money, blocked out the schedule to come and join us that I might have a living classroom of intelligent and responsive men uh, to which the lectures will be delivered. And I welcome as well those of you who are hearing the lectures by means of audio tapes or DVDs. We're thankful that you too can be a part of this class as we wrestle together with the Word of God and what it tells us concerning the work of the ministry. John the Baptist said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. We come for this week of lectures and we can receive nothing unless the Lord is pleased to open his hand and to give. So let's pray and ask that his hand will be open to us and that we might receive all that he has for us in our time together. Let's pray. Holy Father, we acknowledge again our utter dependence upon you and upon your grace if we are to receive anything in these days together. So for this very first session of this unit in our study, we ask that you would come with singular blessing, encouraging our hearts that you are committed to meet with us and to bless us be with your servant that he may accurately handle your word, that your servants who sit beneath that word would be given discernment and be able to receive all that you have purposed for them to receive in our days together. We look to you for your blessing and trust you to grant it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, in the first unit of our course in pastoral theology, I address the subject of the calling of the man of God to the pastoral office. In the second unit, I dealt with the life of the man of God in the pastoral office. And in this third unit, we begin to address the vast and vital subject of the public preaching ministry of the man of God in his pastoral office. To speak in the traditional language, we are now moving into the realm of homiletics proper. The Webster's New World Dictionary defines homiletics as follows. It is the branch of theology dealing with the writing and the preaching of sermons, end quote. That definition is good in that it designates homiletics as a branch of theology not a branch of the science of rhetoric. Hence, we know that our approach must be one in which we are in constant contact with God's self-revelation, primarily in the scriptures, but also in general revelation as well. This definition is also commendable in that it makes a distinction between the writing or composition of sermons and the actual preaching or delivery of the sermon. Hence, you will notice in your printed outline that we will deal first of all with the content and form of the sermon, and only when we have dealt with that subject will I move on in another unit to deal with the delivery of the sermon or the act of preaching. Now, by way of introduction, let me set forth an explanation and a justification for this division of the material into these two major categories. First of all, of the content and form of the sermon, or the sermon as it is conceived and as it develops in the womb of the preacher's mind and heart in the study, and then the actual act of delivering the sermon or birthing the sermon in the place of the pulpit. I make this distinction because any serious and accurate reflection on these matters will force us to recognize 
that there is a fundamental difference between the disciplines of exegesis, organization, perception of the thrust of any given sermon, and the dynamics of actually delivering that sermon in the promised special presence of God in the company of the gathered people of God. Specifically, one is primarily a mental, spiritual, and mechanical activity of the closet and of the desk. We're surrounded with our books. We are praying. We are seeking the face of God. We have our pen or pens, our typewriter or our word processor, our computer before us. Those are the commodities of the study. The other is the mental, spiritual, and vocal, and physical activity of the sanctuary when we actually deliver that which has been conceived and has gestated in the study. To change the imagery or to carry the imagery further, the former constitutes conception and gestation of the sermon. The other can be likened to alive or sometimes a still birth. Of the sermon. To use a scriptural analogy, Luke 3, verses 2 and 3 tell us the word of God came to John. Then it says, and John came preaching. The word coming, and then the word being delivered by the servant of God. So then, as we begin to consider the public preaching ministry of the man of God, we will do so under this first major division the message in its content and its form. As we open up this aspect of our study, all of the substance of the lectures will be delivered in two major categories. General principles or axioms applicable to all kinds or species of sermons, and then in another unit, the specific guidelines for the various species of sermons in other words, a textual sermon, a topical sermon, a consecutive expository sermon, principles applicable to those various species. And by the way, species or species is both considered, are both considered correct according to our American dictionaries. Now today, we're going to take up the first of these axioms, and it is this, the proclamation explanation and application of scriptural truth in the power of the Holy Spirit must constitute the heart and soul of all preaching. And if you don't have the word our in there, place it in your notes, of all our preaching. Few issues related to preaching need more clear and emphatic articulation than does this axiom. In opening up the axiom, I shall follow out three lines of biblical argument to show that it is based upon the clear testimony of the Word of God. First of all, the function of scriptural truth or special inscripturated revelation in the saving purposes of God. We will never really feel the pressure of this axiom unless we are absolutely persuaded of that unique function of scriptural truth or special inscripturated revelation in the saving purposes of God. Let me attempt to draw your minds into this subject by quoting the words of Gardner Spring in his classic work entitled, The Power of the Pulpit. In the chapter entitled, The Truth of Which the Pulpit is the Vehicle, he writes on pages 36 and 37 these most perceptive words. What are the constituent elements of the power with which the pulpit is invested? And he answers, while the pulpit possesses all that belongs to the province of moral suasion in its ordinary and best forms, it has peculiarities which the ordinary forms of moral suasion do not possess. 
There are principles, some of which at least account for the power it exerts beyond that which is exerted by any other means of intellectual conviction or any other moral influences that are known among men. The first of these is the truth itself of which it is the vehicle. The God of heaven is the God of truth. Truth is infinitely dear to his pure and holy mind. He is its great asserter and guardian, nor will he be respected, loved, and obeyed, and this earth filled with his glory until it is flooded with his truth as the waters cover the sea. The scriptures instruct us that truth is the great instrumentality by which his purposes of mercy are accomplished, the wisely selected means by which he operates, a means well adapted to the end, nay, the necessary and indispensable means, because truth alone presents the only objects of all that variety of right thoughts and holy affections and emotions which constitute true religion. The pulpit has no other instrumentality. It, the pulpit, has accomplished its vocation when it has fully, clearly, and with a right spirit exhibited the claims of truth. And then he goes on to reinforce those assertions even more emphatically in the remaining part of the quote that you have in your notes. The function of scriptural truth in the saving purposes of God, it is absolutely central, both with respect to begetting divine life in the soul and to the nurturing and to the development of that life in the hearts of God's people. You know the text, James 1 and verse 18, of his own will he begot us by the word of truth. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 and 24, in writing to the saints of God throughout Asia Minor, Peter writes, seeing you have purified your souls in your obedience to the truth, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, love one another from the heart fervently, having been begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides. And here again, the emphasis is upon the begetting power of that word of truth. Or 1 Corinthians 4.15, where the apostle says that he has begotten the Corinthians spiritually by the gospel that he preached unto them or the familiar words of Romans 10, 14 and following, in which the apostle ties together in the closest relationship the preaching of the word of God by the sent ones and the coming to faith among God's elect. If we are earnest concerning usefulness in the great work of seeing sinners brought to faith, we must heed the words of the prophet Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 28 and 29, hear these words of the prophet who said, The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. He that has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the straw to the wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer, that breaks the rock in pieces. So in the begetting of divine life, it is that word of truth that God is committed to bless and to use to bring people to faith and to repentance. Again, in the power of the pulpit, Gardner Spring writes, there is no better definition of spiritual and practical Christianity than that it is the counterpart of truth in the heart and in the life. It is the fruit of God's Spirit operating by His truth 
and producing in the once alienated heart that delightful reconciliation of its nature and claims which constitute the life of God in the soul of man. It is the image of the heavenly where but just now there was nothing but the image of the earthly. It is the loveliest exhibition of the power of truth when men gladly receive the word, the engrafted word, which is able to save the soul. When the darkened understanding is illuminated and the truth is thus understood and received, the gospel comes then, not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. It comes with peace and joy. It binds up the heart. It comforts the mourner. It sets the captive free. It solaces the soul with divine love. It shows the path of life. It begets it, that is the soul, to a living hope of an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fades not away. And there is more that you have in your notes of of Gardner Springs emphasis upon this wonderful reality that the truth is the divine instrument for the begetting of spiritual life in the soul of men, but then secondly, in the nurturing of the divine life. Surely, we all know the prayer of our Lord, John 17, 17. Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Or Ephesians 4, 15, speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things. Or Paul's words to Timothy, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, all scripture is God-breathed and is also profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. In summary then, with respect to the function of scriptural truth in the saving purposes of God, I can do no better than to quote again from Gardner Spring, this time from his book entitled The Glory of Christ, in a wonderful chapter in which he's developing the theme of Christ's glory as a preacher. Listen to his words. From these we learn in the first place, that our Lord was a most instructive preacher. The knowledge of God's truth is the germ and principle of all holiness. Spiritual life can neither germinate nor be developed in the dark and cold bosom of ignorance. To overlook this great law of man's intellectual and moral nature is to overlook what is primary and essential to the great end at which the gospel aims. There is no appeal to the conscience or heart, no obligation urged, no right emotions excited, and no practical conformity to God cultivated except by presenting and believing the great doctrines of the gospel. Jesus Christ would have the roots of Christianity strike deep in the barren soil of this ungodly world, and therefore he taught that the sower sows the word. The great object of his ministry was to disabuse the minds of men of error, to unteach them where they had been taught erroneously, to enlighten them where they were ignorant, to set the great realities of a supernatural revelation before them, place them within their reach, and make them possessors of this rich inheritance. He knew of no other means of disarming the powers of death and hell, delivering men from the empire of Satan and the bondage of sin, introducing them into the liberty of the children of God, and rendering them partakers of the life eternal. His spirit operates only through the instrumentality of truth, it is one of the laws of his kingdom that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So there's my first line of argument that this axiom is rooted in the perspectives forced upon us 
by the word of God that preaching must have as its heart and its soul the proclamation, explanation, and application of scriptural truth in the power of the Holy Spirit. But then we come, secondly, to the nature of the ministerial and preaching office. The nature of the ministerial and preaching office. When you and I stand to minister the word of God, what is our precise identity? Who am I when I stand in that pulpit on the Lord's day? Who are you when you stand in the place where you preach the word? What is your identity? How do you view yourself? Are we to think of ourselves as religious philosophers, motivators, promoters, entertainers, educators, orators, psychologists, or I was once asked to come to a conference and be the facilitator. I told him, I don't know how to facilitate. I'm a preacher. You want me to come and preach? I'll preach. I don't know how to facilitate. What is your identity? How do you view yourself? Well, let me suggest, brethren, that there are several lines of, of biblical revelation that identify us that we need constantly to keep before our minds and hearts in our sense of who we are. Our identity is to be understood in the synthesis of this rich terminology and imagery, particularly captured in the following words. First of all, a herald. The apostle said in 2 Timothy 1 in verse 11 that he was appointed, among other things, to be a herald, a kerux. Now, what was the primary function of the kerux? Well, it was nothing more or less than to deliver the message of the sovereign exactly as the sovereign gave it to the kerux. When he came into the town and he was identified as the kerux, he was to give the kerugma, which was the message entrusted by his sovereign. All of that message, but only that message, nothing more, nothing less. And again and again in the New Testament, preaching is described in that verbal form. It is an act of keruso. It is an act of the herald proclaiming the God-given message. Matthew 3, 1 of John the Baptist, of our Lord in Matthew 4, 17. In 2 Corinthians 4, 5, the apostle speaks of himself. And then in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, herald the word, preach the word. This is our identity, and we must be conscious of that as we preach. Dabney, in his lectures on sacred rhetoric, addresses this very explicitly when he says, the nature of the preacher's work is determined by the word employed to describe it by the Holy Ghost. The preacher is a herald. He is a kerux. His work is heralding the king's message. Once the apostles called themselves Christ ambassadors, but of old ambassadors were no other than heralds. Now the herald does not invent his message. He merely transmits and explains it. It is not his to criticize its wisdom or fitness. This belongs to his sovereign alone. On the one hand, he does not carry it as a mere implement of sound, a trumpet or a drum. He's an intelligent medium of communication with the king's enemies. He has brains as well as a tongue. He is expected so to deliver and explain his master's mind that the other party shall receive not only the mechanical sounds, but the true meaning of the message. On the other hand, it wholly transcends his office to presume to correct the tenor of the propositions he conveys by either additions or change. These are the words of God's commission to an ancient preacher. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. That's our task as heralds 
of the living God. But then the second word, ambassador. Presbea, presbuo, the verbal form, found in the verbal form in 2 Corinthians 5.20, we then are ambassadors for Christ. Again in Ephesians 6.20, the noun form, Luke 14.32, they sent an ambassador or ambassadors to make peace. And in 19.14 of Luke, now what is the function of an ambassador? but to represent the mind and the will of the sovereign who sends him. And then we are stewards, oikonomos. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 1, let people regard us for who and what we really are. And then he tells us what his identity is. Let a man so account of us. And remember, Paul is speaking not only of himself with his unique apostolic identity, but of those of lesser office who were his companions in labor. Let a man so account of us as of ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. A steward is one who has an entrustment and Paul says, we are stewards of the revealed secrets of God. And then he goes on to say, the great requirement of a steward, not that he be clever, not that he be successful, moreover it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Faithful. That's why he says it's a very little thing. He didn't say it's nothing. For anyone to say it's absolutely nothing, whether I be judged of others. There's something sick with a man who's not affected at all, but he says it's a very little thing. Very little thing if I be judged of you or of man's judgment. He that judges me is the Lord. I seek to discharge my responsibilities as a steward before the eye of him. And in the last day, if I can hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's all I strive for. But then we have the concept of a ruler. We have the verb hegeomai in Hebrews 13, 7. Remember them that had the rule over you, men who spoke unto you the word of God. This was their fundamental identity of all the things they did in that place of spiritual authority and rule. This was the dominant, foundational, prominent task. They spoke unto you the word of God. In that rule, the word of God was that by which they ruled and by which they governed. When we bring these four descriptions together, what is their common denominator? The common denominator is that the task of each one of those pictures, those various descriptions of who and what we are, is that we are tethered to a fixed body of authoritatively revealed truth. And all of our functions are to be understood in terms of our relationship to that truth. Then we come thirdly to the explicit commands of Scripture. We've looked at the place of truth in the begetting and nurturing of divine life, the nature of the pastoral office. Now the explicit commands of Scripture. In both the Old and the New Testaments, those who are set apart to be the official teachers of God's people are commanded to traffic in the Word of God and in that Word alone. And I've given you some Old Testament references. You remember in that whole incident with that strange character Balaam, we have some wonderfully instructive words that come out of the mouth of this strange and bizarre man. In Numbers 22 and verse 35, the book of Numbers, chapter 22 and verse 35. And the angel of the Lord said unto Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak unto you, that 
you shall speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. Verse 38. And Balaam said unto Balak, Lo, I am come unto you. Have I now any power at all to speak anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that shall I speak. Chapter 24, verses 12 and 13. And Balaam said unto Balak, Spake I not also to your messengers that you sent unto me, saying, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord to do either good or bad of my own mind. What the Lord speaks, that will I speak. Surely, brethren, these are the kind of words we could do well to put on a plaque and the pulpit that was constantly before us, what God has given, that and that alone I am committed to speak. And then we read the words in Jeremiah, he that has a dream, let him speak his dream, that he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. And then the promise of God in Jeremiah 3.15, that under the new covenant, God says, I will give them shepherds after my own heart who shall feed them with knowledge and with understanding, the knowledge and understanding of the word of the living God. When we come to the New Testament, we have the great commission in Matthew 28, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever, extensive, intensive, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end or consummation of the age. There is the command that Christ's words, those words in all of their fullness are to be taught. Or 2 Timothy 2.15, Do your utmost, Timothy, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, cutting a straight course in the word of truth. And then after reminding him of the nature of Scripture, that it is God-breathed revelatory data, he then says to him in chapter 4 and verse 2, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and with teaching. In conclusion, consider the two final scriptures, Nehemiah 8 and verse 8, is a marvelous passage to constantly set before ourselves in terms of what our task is. Nehemiah 8 and verse 8. The first time when you had a situation where between the inscripturated, revelatory data that God had given his people and his people, there was a linguistic barrier. And what did these men do? Nehemiah 8 and verse 8. And they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly, and they gave the sense so that they understood the reading. Here they have the documents before them. They have a linguistic problem. What did they do? They sought accurately to convey to their hearers the mind and will of God as embodied in those documents. This was their task, which they did and in a real sense became prototypes of new covenant expositors of Scripture because we have that barrier between the language in which God revealed his mind and those to whom we are speaking, and our responsibility is to give the sense so that they understand the reading. Now, growing out of that axiom, there are corollaries. Our British friends say corollaries. I understand that, but we Americans say corollaries. You have corollaries, and we acknowledge your right to have your corollaries, and we acknowledge our right to have our corollaries. These related truths that naturally flow out of 
that axiom. And I want to address the first in the remainder of our time in this first session, and it is this. Your sermons should be thoroughly exegetical in their raw materials. If the proclamation, explanation, application of scriptural truth in the power of the Holy Spirit should constitute the heart and soul of all of our preaching, then surely our sermons should be thoroughly exegetical in their raw materials. Since we believe that God has spoken in words which the Holy Spirit has chosen, 1 Corinthians 2.13, we must have, as the raw materials of all of our preaching, a commitment to deal honestly and fairly with the very words of Scripture. One has written, exegesis is predicated on two fundamentals. First, it assumes that thought can be accurately conveyed in words. All of postmodern epistemology and the rest, notwithstanding, we believe that God can convey thoughts in words, each of which, at least originally, had its own shade of meaning. Second, it assumes that the content of Scripture is of such superlative importance for man as to warrant the most painstaking effort to discover exactly what God seeks to impart through his word. And then the quote you have in your notes from Albert Barnes. I quote him. The Bible should be explained not under the influence of a vivid imagination, but under the influence of a heart and a mind imbued with a love of truth and by an understanding discipline to investigate the meaning of words and phrases and capable of rendering a reason for the interpretation which is proposed. Hence, our concern for, if not a working acquaintance with the original languages, a determination to use what we English speakers have, a plethora of aids to help us to come to an accurate understanding of the mind of God in the text of Scripture. Sloppy exegesis in sermons is absolutely without excuse given the tools with which God has surrounded us. You may not be able to take your Hebrew Bible, your Greek text, and work easily directly from those sources, but that does not excuse sloppy exegesis. There is so much available help to us, but wherever possible, and this is where I would put in a little plug for our influence to any men with aspirations to the ministry to encourage a course of study that forces them to wrestle with the original languages. Because the closer we can come to the text in which God spoke to us, the more likelihood that we will accurately handle that word. And in that quote you have from Warfield on the purpose of the seminary, he has a very powerful statement about this desirability. This will mean if we are thoroughly exegetical, there will be certain things that we will not allow to influence what we say the text says. Number one, the initial impression of a text or passage. Over the years, I've had many a sermon or sermon outline scrapped from its powerful first impression upon my mind. When I began to do serious exegetical work, it all just vaporized or came to pieces before my eyes. I said, the text simply doesn't say what the first impression upon my mind I thought it said. And that's a humbling thing. But if you're going to be honest with the Word of God, you've got to be prepared for that. So it is not the initial impression of a text or passage that will regulate what we say about it. Or secondly, the traditional use of a text. 
Not a few texts are used to prove a biblical truth, but the text doesn't prove that truth. And when people handle it that way, they're not teaching heresy, but they are not accurately, honestly expounding that passage. One that you're all familiar with is the old authorized version's translation of Galatians 3.24. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. And how that is used in a way totally foreign to the context of the law as a dispensation in the history of redemption. It's not speaking of the function of the Ten Commandments in particular to bring a sinner to an awareness of his sinfulness. And then there are times when the dogmatic use or flavor of a text, I've heard Isaiah 33, 14 used uh, as a threatening text. Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? Do you want to dwell in everlasting burnings? As though it's speaking of hell. It's not. It's speaking of God. He's the everlasting burnings. And he's on to say that it's only those who are righteous that can dwell with such a God. And then there are the fanciful, allegorical, or spiritualizing uses of text. I've had one that I said, Lord, it'd be lovely to be released from my own convictions for just one time. When old Israel says, you have the voice of Jacob, but your hands are the hands of Esau. Oh, what a wonderful text to allegorize. You talk like a Christian reformed preacher, but you act as carnal as a goat. You got the voice of Jacob, but you got the hands of an Esau, the wild man. I'd love to go to town on that, <laughs> but I can't do it, no. And then a clever and forced accommodation of a text. And this, of course, is something that is shameful when it's indulged, and Dabney addresses it uh, very clearly uh, in the quote that is before you. So, this is the first and the most fundamental corollary that we should be thoroughly exegetical in our handling of the Word of God. If you should earn the reputation as a safe and trusted guide in the Scriptures, and if you would furnish your people with a proper set of principles for interpreting the Bible on their own, by your example, teach them how to handle their Bibles responsibly. And brethren, it will mean sometimes that you know for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes you're going to be a very dull preacher. There are times when no amount of animation, no amount of illu illustrate, no mechanism that I know of can, can get you through saying with your people, put on your thinking cap, tighten your seatbelt, and we've got to work through this matter to ascertain the mind of God in this passage. And you've got to die to the itch to be popular all the time and to be easy to listen to. There are times you will make rigid demands upon your people. And if you've done everything possible to make it as simple, as clear, as plain, then just tighten your seatbelt and urge them to hang in there with you and work through in opening up the text, opening up and revealing to your people the mind of God in a clear, in a perspicuous way. And over the years, your people are absorbing without knowing it a wonderful pattern of principles of sound hermeneutics and how to handle the scriptures. And what that does is, as they are gathering more and more their own set of internalized principles of hermeneutics, it's putting more and more demands upon you to live up to the standard that is growing all the time in them. And to me, that's been one of the many blessings of a lengthy pastorate. It keeps the pressure on me to make sure that I'm doing nothing that violates the very principles I'm teaching my people by example. You follow what I'm saying? And at the end of the day, to leave a people that can open up their Bibles and reasonably come to an understanding of them. And if there are passages they don't understand, they've learned from you that there are some things hard to be understood. Peter found some of Paul hard to understand. 
and there's a realism and they're willing to suspend the, their itch to want to know what this means and say there are some things difficult and I can live with that. And we cultivate under God a people who handle their Bibles in a responsible way because we've set the pattern for them in our own ministries. So may God help us then as we are committed that our ministries will be in their heart and soul the proclamation, explanation, and application of scriptural truth in the power of the Holy Spirit that we will manifest that we truly believe we are what God says we are. We are heralds to proclaim the message of the King. We are stewards with a responsibility to handle the mysteries of God responsibly that we are, by the grace of God, those whose only standard of exercising rule in God's house is God's holy and infallible word. Well, let's pray and ask God to write these things upon our hearts. Our Father, we're thankful that you've given us a word. We thank you that you've given us that word that we hold in our hands, that we call our Bibles, these 66 books written over hundreds of years, and yet one message that points us to one Savior, one hope of life and salvation, we ask that you would write upon our hearts afresh what we are as your servants and enable us by your grace to be faithful in the task to which you've called us, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.